Hello and welcome once more to Conscious TV. I'm Ian McNay and my guest today is Jürgen Ziva. Hello Jürgen. Hi Ian, hi. And Jürgen's from Germany but he lives in Worthing in, uh, on the south coast of England so he hasn't come too far today. No. So Jürgen has three books out and one of the books I found and it really interested me called The Ten Minute Moment, A Week Long Adventure in Consciousness and we're going to spend a little time talking about this when he was on a retreat for a week in a remote cabin in Scotland and his experiences during that time. He has two other books out, Vistas of Infinity and Multidimensional Man. And actually the interview is really in two parts because my wife Renata is going to do a second part after this which will cover more the latter two books and I'm going to cover more the meditation side which is more in the first book. So Jürgen, um, like so many people you experimented at a fairly early age mm -hmm. with meditation and exploring consciousness and I know you realised also that, um, or you said in, in one of the books, you refused to accept my five senses were all that is to reality and that led to a lifelong quest. So. Mm -hmm. You understood that at a fairly early age, didn't you? Yes, I mean, the earliest time I remember that I queried uh, reality was actually when I was four years old. Huh. Um, and the interesting thing was I, I couldn't figure out who this body was or who it belonged to. So I asked my mother, uh, would he, uh, who am I? You know, huh. and, and she said, oh, you're Jürgen. And I said, no, 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 who is behind Jürgen? She said, no, she said, you're Jürgen. And I couldn't, couldn't get to grips with the concept of me being a name. And in the end, I started crying, <laughs> you know. And, and I think that's probably quite natural for, for kids anyway. But I, there was always this sort of searching awareness. But uh, the big break came, I think, the, the upheaval came when my father died, when I was nine years old you know, who, who was sort of torn away out of my life uh, in a very dramatic way, you know, when I came back from holiday, um, uh, children's holiday, he was actually at home dying and he looked unrecognizable to me because I hadn't seen him for six months before because he was in a, in a university clinic in South Germany. And this was a tremendous shock to me and um, so much so that I, I never really touched on it, you know, I couldn't bear the idea of addressing it. But of course, now I feel that was possibly instrumental for me to search for um, a permanence in life, for something that doesn't die, that cannot go away, and subconsciously that must have been at the base of, of everything that followed. And in a way, we're all searching for this permanence in life, aren't mm, we? Mm. And even if we aren't necessarily interested in consciousness or mm. looking somewhere in our daily life, we look for this stability or ground of being, as it's often called. Yes, yes. And there, therein lies the problem, mostly, because where we try to find the stability is in the things which can't give us a feeling mm -hmm. of permanence. Mm. And so we start building up more and more a kind of uh, world which we associate with stability, education, a family, a home, an income and so on, you know. And around these, these things we build our identity and then uh, we cement it, uh, we build beliefs until we have sort of, at, at the middle age we have firmly established our persona, you know. But of course, that's not the real, the real thing, is it? <laughs> and the cracks also start to appear. The cracks they start appeared appearing already, and yeah. they gradually sort of fall, things fall apart and we become ill and things don't work, we lose our jobs and so on. So the stability, we try to cement it again and keep it back together, but we know deep down it's not going to last. So your, your kind of practical journey, one of the things you did when you were a student, you took LSD when it was still legal. Yes. And that was quite significant, wasn't it? Yes, it was interesting because we were, I, I studied art 
and we were interested in Max Ernst, uh, surrealists, you know, and of course, as we know, these people were quite into experimenting with all sorts of substances. And then a friend of mine gave me this book by Aldous Huxley, and I thought that's uh, something I want to try. So uh, Aldous Huxley, Doors of Perception, <coughs> I read this, and then we set out on this uh, very controlled environment. We had uh, nobody had any idea what was going to happen, and of course that was uh, literally flung the doors open for my mind. I suddenly realized that everything I sort of believed in and put together is just surface mm. appearance. Underneath it all, there was a uh, a shiny uh, something a little bit more substantial, which didn't change, you know, which was continuous, you know, and that was something that grabbed me, that grabbed my attention. Now, I wanted, of course, to. Um, to have more of this kind of experience. So the next six months, we set once a month, set time aside to repeat the experiment. Until the last time, um, I had the same sort of experience of an underlying stable reality, but, and, and the euphoria that goes with it, you know. But the crucial thing was, when the trip finished, I suddenly the opposite sunk in, that I was confronted with a reality, a physical reality, which seemed to be totally overwhelming and, and in total contrast to what I had experienced. And of course, that was, then I made the decision that, you know, you have to find another way to attain this permanence, this state of mind. Because <coughs> the LSD was only ever going to give you a, a taste, an it, artificial yeah, taste, just, wasn't it? Just a taste. And, and of course, it also led to depression. You know, the, seeing the dis discrepancy <coughs> between the, the high experience and the reality of physical existence led to a, a deep depression in mm. me, you know. And, and uh, I couldn't function until a friend of mine suggested, why don't you try meditation, you know. Until then it really hadn't occurred to me. So I then um, enrolled on a course of Transcendental Meditation. And, um, and indeed after about three or four months, my meditation, uh, you know, went. And I then took a real interest in the whole process of meditation. <coughs> because I could clearly see the beneficial aspects of it. So you again could find this ground, this permanence. Yeah, I, I know I didn't at that time, but I yeah. felt there's a it had a calming, soothing, yes. and and in it uh, stimulated my interest in the origin of meditation, which was the Eastern philosophies, you know. And then I opened myself up. First, somebody recommended a, a book by Paul Bronton. That was the first book on spirituality I ever read. And then I became more and more interested in the Eastern philosophy at that time. You have to bear in mind, at that time, there was this revival or the hippie sort of tra trail which led to India. A lot of people went to India and uh, to hear the teaching from the horse's mouth, so to speak. You yes. know? And uh, that included myself. I also went to India for six months and um, came back um, and and then I got seriously involved in, in all kinds of different types of meditation. And you were doing four or five hours a day at one point, weren't yes, you? Yes, at one stage, <coughs> at one stage I felt I really wanted to become enlightened. <laughs> I had no idea what that meant. I had a vague idea what it could mean because of the previous experience. But, but that became a sort of a little bit of an obsession, you know, with me and and of course, also, uh, I was quite young, so there was a sort of useful energy and drive behind it. And uh, I very much treated it as like a attaining a qualification, you know, for which I had to study <laughs> and do a lot of work. And that was not the how I understand meditation, what meditation is now. So my meditation uh, consisted of 
uh, going inside, uh, focusing my attention, focusing on the mantra, on, on the sound, on the light, and doing yoga in between, carrying on, falling asleep, waking myself up. And it was almost quite a torturous exercise, which lasted two, three, four hours, you know, and then in the evening again. So, so you put together a program yourself that you yes. felt worked for you. Yes, but it mm. didn't work. It it yes. it uh, had the opposite effect, really, because um, for one thing, it it made me, if anything, a little bit more aggressive and mm. agitated, you know. And I also noticed it brought things to the surface, um, which came from the subconscious, you know. Anxieties. Well, that, yes, and that's what happens. Like yes, that. yes. Yeah. And I, I did. I had no way of dealing with it. Mm -hmm. You know. So, so my way of dealing with it was uh, painting. You know. And at that time, I painted uh, uh, what it was called uh, sort of surrealistic or fantastic realism. I had a teacher from Vienna, um, Rudolf Hausner, who taught this type of painting style, which was very detailed, very realistic. And I started painting my shadows, my demon, my inner demons, you know. <coughs> and I became very fascinated with them. They, they created a form of release and, and they took on really very minute detail and shape. And I could feel the energy sort of channeling into these demons and the whole picture Mm -hmm. I reserved one space in the middle which wasn't a demon, you know. And so that was my outlet of um, uh, dealing with my shadow. Yeah, but it's all part of the meditation, mm. wasn't it? It, it was, was all one way, process. Yes. Mm. yes, yeah. And then you were, you were telling me that you were in a market one day having, mm. think, having breakfast and you had quite a experience then. Yes, but uh, that came... The story carries on a little bit because what happened one night when I was um, uh, painting, I then went to my meditation room, which was next to my studio, and then suddenly I heard this mighty bang and and a clutter. And as I went back into the studio, the painting had fallen off the easel, and an ashtray was flung right across the room, which over five meters. Uh, you know, tumbling across the room with the ash uh, fag and sort of, I then smoked, you know, uh, scattered all over the room and there was no open window, nothing that could have mm. caused it. And at that time I, I didn't believe in anything supernatural. To me that was just superstition, you know. But uh, the first thing I noticed uh, was an incredible fear, you know, and, and cold up a fear in you. Yeah. yeah, I was incredibly scared. Mm. I didn't know what was going on, and there was this distinct chill in the room. And then I decided uh, whatever I had been doing was not the right thing to do. You know, I had to stop this. So I then decided to give up meditation for good. You know, and I, I turned my back to it and thought that was a really bad, bad call. Uh, I'm never going to do it again. And by that time, I had already meditated for about. Uh, two and a half, three years, you know. So that was a total lifestyle change for me. But in a way, I was also quite relieved because what it meant was I could do what normal people did at my age, you know, and that was rather a hedonistic way of living. <laughs> but just, I think it's useful just for maybe other people that are watching this, just to briefly look back on that. Mm -hmm. So you got the message for yourself yeah. that he was still fairly young, you were mm -hmm. an art student at that mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. to, to, to do what art, art students normally do, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I'm Going sure is lots of interesting things. things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but d looking back on it now, do you see something deeper or do you see more of an explanation of what was actually going on? Yes, I, I think what I have done was actually I went into a quite a deep, deep thing then, you know. I, I stirred some shadows are up, you know, but I also went quite deep because what I had done uh, was still working in the unconscious, kept on working while I went back to my student life, 
to my normal life. It still was working its way through me without me actually doing anything. And then this thing happened, what you were just referring to. Yes, yeah, so I guess what I'm, I'm, I'm getting is the message was to cool things down for a time. Yes. The process was going on, yes. although you weren't actively meditating. No, I wasn't even paying any attention to it. And what you were doing, proposed me doing, was maybe too intense. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So then the, the market experience happened totally out of the blue. I, you know, I went to the market, uh, which was on every Wednesday, and I bought uh, fresh bread and a cheese and, and made a strong cup of coffee. And I really enjoyed a really sort of nice breakfast. You know, every Wednesday there was a bit of a ritual. But this day, that was about, I think, about six months after I had stopped meditating. This time I was just trying to eat my sandwich when I suddenly lost my uh, connection to my to my hands and to to the act of having breakfast I couldn't relate to it. it I was I felt sort of alienated you know and and I suddenly had the thought who am I who is who is this who is doing this you know and then from at that moment I was kind of taken this question was sort of taking me over and it zipped me out of this current reality and it was almost as if some voice said to me oh there you are you know where have you been there you are mm. and it was a, like a like a welcoming a very benign beautiful experience of welcoming me back like an exile okay and and this, the moment this happened, I surrendered myself to this feeling and I was, I went into this incredible ecstasy of, of light. And suddenly everything took on a luminous uh, quality and, and I, before I knew I was surrounded in this incredible feeling of homecoming, mm. you know, of arriving back to, to to the source where I had sprung from. And, and it didn't stop, it went on and on and deeper and deeper and I, I felt I, I couldn't take much more of that because when I thought I had arrived at some point, it took me deeper and deeper until, um, until one point I had this incredible clarity. There was nothing, nothing that I could give any attributes. There was just total clarity. There was no bias, no, um, no attributes. It was just pure, pure consciousness, if, you know, if I can use this word. Um, and, yeah, and then, of course, this didn't last, but everything became brilliantly clear to me, everything made sense. And, and then I was, the light sort of around me dimmed and I was taken back to the physical reality and uh, which was accompanied with, with quite intense emotion, emotional um, pain if you like, yeah. feelings, you know, yeah. and I started sort of falling down and crying like a, like a child you know, who had sort of, um, and that, that was, uh, that was the experience which set me up mm. on my path. And then I took up meditation again after that, but, but then my meditation was more like um, a thank you rather than wanting something, you know, it was more like, like something uh, coming from the heart, a focus. So it wasn't this drive to no. become enlightened. No, no, that has yeah. had to disappear. Yes. Because I knew that was not the issue, that was not relevant, yeah. that was an illusion. It's interesting because life really was guiding you somehow, wasn't yes. it? Yes, yes it was, yeah. It was taking you mm. gently mm. to find mm. your authentic yeah. path. Yes. Yeah. Of course, um, for two weeks 
after this experience, I was in a state of of oneness. You know, I was um, everything I saw, everything I experienced that happened around me, I, I, I was intimately related to. And I had this incredible peace, you know, mm. the stillness. And then this, this, I couldn't talk to anyone about it. I wouldn't even know how to begin, you know. I, I went back to college. So I just left it, and, and it gradually subsided, uh, this feeling. But what, what I was left with was a knowing where I had to go, where I had I, I was left with a direction, okay? It was almost as if this experience had left a lighthouse on the horizon mm -hmm. which showed me where I had to uh, pin my attention on, you know. And then gradually after this, um, you know, we went to England and things happened. So you but got married and you went yes, to England. That's yeah. right. But, uh, but the interesting thing was which I also mentioned, I had this presence started to ha establish itself in my life, like which I've referred to as a silent, my silent companion, you know, an awareness that there was something more to me, something bigger, you know, and that presence never left me, you know. So talk, talk more about the silent companion, how, how, you've, how you've felt your relationship with it. I know it changed over time, but yes. how you felt it initially. Yes, so the first thing was um, I became aware of the silent companion when I, when I had the, these moments of stillness, um, when I was waiting for a train or something, I, or when I wasn't doing anything. There was a, I felt there was a presence of beingness. And, and this presence was almost like a person. It was a very personable feeling I could relate to. And it was gentle and, and beautiful. But it had no identity as such. It was just an aspect of what I saw, an aspect of a, a higher awareness, if you like. Okay? And, and this, um, I used this silent companion. It never I didn't have any voice or spoke to me. It was just an awareness, and so I could direct my any questions to it, and it would answer with the silence. And the silence gave me a space to to deep into the deeper levels, and sometimes I would find the answers this way. So when you said it answer with silence it was more it was more like a space you could fall into yes is yes, that right it, it gave me a space yes and uh, and out of this space it came came the answer in some way mm. and and i also noticed it only was there when i was uh, in a state of of surrender or, you know or in a state of not wanting things mm. if i wanted things or if i if I acted out of intent or, or selfishness, it was just wasn't there. It, mm. I couldn't acce access it. So, so that was another teaching aspect on my path that I knew if I behaved <coughs> inauthentically or out of sync, then I lost this contact with my silent companion. So that was the reason why People always say, y who was your teacher, you know? And I didn't have a teacher. That, to me, was my teacher, you know? The discrepancy between the authenticity and, and the false, or the, um, the ego, if you like, you know, or the intent, or the selfishness. So, so I always felt cut off the moment I felt there was something uh, coming in which, uh, you know, was sort of selfish, or I, I called it, there was a certain arrogance, certain characteristics in me that came to the surface. Um, you know, uh, our arrogance was one of the things uh, which I noticed very early on that I, I had to be very aware of, you know, because it destroyed the connection and, and any of these things. Um, so that kept me on the path. 
and of course, um, in the meantime, the other thing happened with my out-of-body experiences. You know, you had a lot of those, and I, we're going to cover those actually mm. when Renata interviews you in the other interview because <coughs> there's so much I want to yes. cover on the okay. meditation. I know it's very significant. Yeah, because there's an overlap. Yes. You know. Yes. Mm. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, you. To skip forward, and we have to do that if we're going to to get to talk about the uh, the ten minute moment book, which mm. is the one I really want to mm -hmm. talk about. Um, you, you raised your family with your wife mm -hmm. and you were still doing some meditation, but yes. less. Yes. And then it seems from the notes I picked up that the next really significant thing was in 2011, mm -hmm. you were diagnosed with bowel cancer. Yes, that's right, yes. Which was quite a shock, but talk yes. about that because something very positive came out of that. Yes, that was an interesting episode because um, at that time, I felt sort of invincible and invulnerable. You know, I was meditating uh, regularly, sort of two hours every day, and I didn't pay much attention to my health or anything, or uh, anything to do with physical thing. I was quite intensely focused on um, on on a pervading awareness around me. I became much more. By that time, I had sort of nearly. 40 years of meditation, my my path sort of began to open a bit, you know, I became much more aware of these experiences, these peak experiences, I had became more and more frequent. But the thing was, I was still sort of fascinated by, by everyday reality, you know, and with all its trappings and things. And then when I was, um, I had a routine um, Checkup, and they discovered I had bowel cancer, and uh, that came to me as a little bit of a surprise, you know, a sh shock, you know, because I couldn't figure out where this fitted in into my life. So I thought, oh, and the interesting thing was, two of my friends died of bowel cancer the same mm. year, mm. you know, one of my wife's friend, and then another friend. Um, died and and I said, oh, I I might die, you know, I might be dead in six months. I suddenly thought, you know, and and then I suddenly thought the only way to to live now is to live in the present moment, you know. For one thing, I didn't want to engage in this sort of idea of cancer. I didn't want to engage with the the illness. I thought, okay, I better leave this to the doctors. Okay, I just want to engage with the reality. So, I suddenly found the best way to deal with it is to focus on on every moment, just the pure moment, what is happening now, in time. Okay, and if there are thoughts or anxieties or whatever it is, they are just a distraction from the moment. So. <coughs> So that was a positive aspect of the cancer because it, my meditation became a 24-7 exercise. So when, when you say you focus on the present moment, mm. what does that mean practically? Practically was that when thoughts came or, or negative feelings, I looked at what actually was the supporting element of making these feelings happen, which was a present, which was a here and now, okay? And by that time I realized I found it much more easy to focus on the underlying reality of, of the appearances in life. And that became more intense. I only had to look at things um, to remind myself you know, it could be any any object. Any object was a representative of of the present being state. So I forever, when when I got lost or sidetracked, and even things like wasting time, like going into a library and going through books or something, I thought, okay, don't waste time. Just just be, okay. And that uh, that became uh, a permanent. Uh, thing then, you know. So, it it comes down in a way. You're you're making a decision. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're saying, I don't want that thought mm -hmm. because it's a negative thought or mm -hmm. doesn't help or takes me away yes. from the present. But if another thought comes, which mm -hmm. is to appreciate the flowers or whatever, mm -hmm. there's an allowing there. Yeah, it wasn't a thought. It was usually guided by a feeling of a, a moment of joy. You know, okay. when, the, when I surrendered this thought and there was nothing else but the present, that was rewarded with a feeling of joy, okay? That made it, so when I favored the presence or an option of the flowers or whatever, when I favored that without thought, I could feel the joy coming from my heart and that mm. enforced the focus on the present. So it actually became easier you know, and the meditation became a, more of a natural thing. Because one thing, we talked about this before we started recording, that I, I really liked, and you talked about this in a couple of your books, that um, to put yourself, I'm just reading some notes here, uh, to put yourself in charge, you'd learn to focus your attention, found that your brain mm. could be trained like a dog. Mm. You did it gently and persistently, mm reminding it to favor the meditation rather than the thoughts and rewarding it with love. Yes, yes. You I thought it was great the way mm. you say training the mind like a dog. Yeah, that's uh, like Pavlov's dog, you know, <laughs> yeah. where, where, where you reward the dog with a uh, biscuit, you know, and, and a bell and it starts salivating. To me, the biscuit was uh, the joy felt when I focus attention on the present. Okay, so so yes, so the brain is basically a machine which can be trained in this way by reward, by rewarding action which are beneficial and ignoring action which are not beneficial, you mm. know. So when, when thoughts come which are uh, distraction or negative or something, you don't pay any attention, you know. you you. In fact, I would say if there's pain of any sort or a negative thought, you can actually use this as a welcome stimulus, okay, like a, um, like, like a, some sort of alert to say, okay, this is not good, it is a reminder that I should pay attention to reality, okay. So it's not even negative, it can mm -hmm. actually be, have a positive service. Um, you know, if something painful happens, something negative, somebody uh, insults you, you know, and you f instantly feel, ah, oh, you know, that's not, I don't like it. That could be a, a, a signal to focus your attention on, on the being state. So it's not, not something negative, you know. It, yes. it is actually a, a welcome stimulus to initiate Pavlos biscuit, you know, to, to, to reward you for favoring the awareness of reality. So there's nothing really negative in life if you follow this, this, uh, this concept through. And, and you learned this yourself? Yes, yes. yes. And um, I learned it through all sorts of things, you know. Um, I, had a, I had a boss when I was working who was a tyrant. Okay. okay. And, and he, I regarded him as possibly my biggest teacher because he told me not to mind. Okay, when we ever had a meeting, he was tyrannizing people. Mm. And some people walked out of the meeting crying. And I trained myself uh, that when I went to a meeting and, and he would bully people, I would actually um, use this as, as an stimulus to, to focus attention on awareness and enjoy the reward of not being affected by, okay. by it. No, okay? because, yeah. because that was the biggest thing. When I did that, I wasn't affected by, by the bullying. Okay? And then it, c it went so far that at one stage I actually was looking forward to the meetings because I could prove every time I was rewarded with this huh. freedom and this liberation from not being affected huh. by people's negative attitudes. So, you know, so, so in a way, this, he became my greatest teacher. Yes. And, and 
that is an extra story because uh, he later, when I was made redundant, we had a big, big row in the end, and um, and I, uh, he was shouting at me and I was shouting back and we were sort of six inches away from <laughs> of each other's faces. But I felt great because there was nothing to lose, you know, and 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 then he turned away. Uh, run out of sort of, and he burst out laughing, and I had to laugh myself. <laughs> so something incredible happened. Then three years later, I met him by chance, and uh, he told me he was uh, diagnosed with cancer, uh -huh. and he was going to die. Uh, okay, so we stood on the street corner and had this really philosophical, interesting conversation, uh -huh. and I I thanked him. I thanked him for what he had given me, <laughs> you know. So he went on his way, uh, you know, uh, knowing yeah. that he had done me a great favor. It's yeah. <laughs> wonderful. So I wonder. I want to now talk more about the Ten Minute Moment mm. book, um, and I think it was in two thousand and thirteen you made the yeah. decision to go for a week yeah. on your own. Mm -hmm and stay in a small cabin in mm -hmm. the Scottish Highlands mm -hmm. and just meditate mm -hmm. and be with yourself. Yes. yes. So just, just guide us through some of the significant things that happened during that time because certainly from what you say in the mm -hmm. book, there was, a, there was a shift in your reality mm -hmm. that hadn't happened before. Yes, <coughs> yes, it was significant because Originally, I wanted to have the retreat in order to gather all my thoughts and, and possibly write another book. And then I talked to a friend of mine, and she said, that is the wrong way to go about it if you go to, on a retreat. You know, you don't go in there with an intent. You know, you just uh, be, be aware. You know, you just focus on meditation and things. And I thought, yes, she had a very good point. So I then said, okay, all I want to do in this week, I just want to focus on awareness 24-7, you know, just being aware and, and meditate. So I spend about eight hours a day in, in deep meditation, and the rest of the time I, I used my camera and went out into this beautiful landscape and used my camera as a focus uh, instrument to focus on on the synchronicity of the beauty and everything, I took pictures. And then uh, <coughs> when I came back, I would enter these into my diaries, these observations, you know, and, and write about it. I also kept a diary about what went on in my meditation, you know, and so because that was part and parcel of being, of the awareness process, you know. But even with the camera, you had a, quite a lesson, didn't you, one day when you went out? Yes, yes, I, I had a fall. Um, and no, I was thinking of something else, actually. Yeah. When you, 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 I pulled out from the book, when you went out with the camera, you realised I had wasted time looking without seeing, yes. feasting my eyes without engaging my heart. Yes, that's, that's true. That was an interesting thing because... Um, I was confronted with this interesting environment in Scotland, beautiful, you know, and there was so much to take in, and I became a bit like a tourist taking snaps. Mm. Okay, okay, I just take these photographs and I look at them later. And while I was doing this, I was missing the whole connection, you know, to, to what I was actually seeing, you know. And of course, when, when I went, came back to look at the photographs, they were all out of focus, you know, because I had, it, had set the aperture to manual, and I wasted a lot of time. So I noticed that um, uh, in order to actually take good photographs, you have to take photographs with your heart, you know, not with your mind. And, and that was a... Because you're also saying you were in such a beautiful part of the mm. world, it needed gratitude from yes. your side to appreciate right. being yes. there. Yes, it, uh, it was offered to me as a gift, you know, and I was just devouring it, Yes, you know, rather than being, showing gratitude and, and reference and worshipping it with my 
is my heart, you know, and say thank you, you know, what an amazing gift this is, you know. So what were the principal challenges? Here you are, you're, you're in a remote place, mm. you didn't take much food with you it seems. Um, no. you, did, you did two things which I thought were very smart. You took with you your pillow. Yes. Because the last <laughs> retreat I did, the pillow was so uncomfortable. <laughs> and you took with you a bean bag. Yes. So you could sit comfortably. Yes, and I, I, I just find they're essential to retreat, a comfortable seat and a good yes. pillow. Yes. So you took those with you. But apart from that, you took no books. No, no, no you books. You just no. brought yourself. Just, just my diary. And yes. my pen. Yes. And, uh, and yeah, the, everything was uh, very basic, you know. The beautiful thing was I connected with everything intimately to the extent that uh, I had a little squirrel visiting me in my hut, you know, which came, became more and more friendly and actually came into my hut when I didn't feed it, you know, demanding food and the birds. And I felt a little bit like... Um, St. Francis, who could talk to the animals, <laughs> you know, I was, I had a really good connection with nature. And, uh, and yeah, when, when my meditation took place, I had, I focused on the bird song, for example, <coughs> and I noticed <coughs> something completely different, which I hadn't noticed before, that each sound had a color, you know, each note, had a color, had a texture, and I suddenly found that the birds were talking to each other and they were responding. And in my meditation, I saw these beautiful colors shifting through the landscape. And I found there's a deeper aspect to what we normally see as nature on the surface. There's something much, much deeper underneath everything, you know. And also when I walked through the woods, and looked at the grass and the plants, <coughs> I could see with the roots how everything was connected, the mm. moss to the trees and everything. And I felt this connectedness very intimately, you know, as I walked through the nature and things. And um, you had this really dramatic experience about two days before the end, didn't you? Mm. Yes. Yes, that was when I went into a very deep meditation and <clears throat> and suddenly I, came, I, I fell into an, an almost limitless abyss of, of reality, you know. It became, it became more, everything became more and more real. And, and I became more and more anxious because I suddenly found that the person who I was uh, had no substance, you know, it, it, everything was uh, at risk, I, everything I was. And but I, but you know, when, you, when you say that everything became more and more real, mm. what do you mean by that? How, how do you know it's more and more real? Well, the thing was, I was confronted with, with something that that was more real than I was, let's put it this way. More uh, real than the feeling of myself, okay, and... But, but, but how do you monitor that? How, how do you know it's more real than yourself? It just felt like an overwhelming force that was in the okay. wings waiting okay. for me and, and almost devouring me. It mm. was something enormous just under the surface waiting to burst out and whatever that was outside it, which was me, had no chance of survival, okay? So um, my, pers my personal self was totally um, uh, at risk of, of being squashed by this enormity of what was waiting for me, okay? Um, it's so difficult to... But when you say personal self, what do you mean? You yeah, mean the personality? My, my, yeah, my, my identity, my, my Jürgenness. Your, your Jürgenness, yeah. yeah. And, and it was uh, scary because at that time I thought, oh, well, I, I, I really have come a long way. I, I solved all the things. You know, I've been meditating for 40 years. But suddenly 
everything was at risk. And I found, if I go one step further, I will be obliterated by this in enormity that was waiting, which was much, much more powerful than I was. And to me, that was God. You know, and mm -hmm. I was always very reluctant to use such a word, you know, because I never dared to uh, even go anywhere near it. But I knew if, if I did actually go that far, then I would simply vanish. You know, I, I had to vanish completely, which felt it could even mean physical death and, and mm -hmm. obliterate. I wouldn't have been surprised if I, I would dissolve into nothingness if I, if I went this step further. So, so that was a very scary prospect. And I didn't see it as a, as a liberating, nice thing. I saw it as a threat to my survival and existence. So I tried to rescue myself by get it coming out of the meditation and trying to re-establish my ego identity. You know, I was desperate to, to have find something I could hold on to again. You see, you see, in the notes that I pulled from your book, you said, in an instant, I recognized that I was just a thought. Yes. An imagination without any substance. Yes, yes. You recognize you were just a thought. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was a big that, that dilemma is, I was in. That's strong, to recognize you're yes, only a thought. Yes. Yeah, and that uh, that was uh, something I, I found I couldn't really uh, accept at that time. There was there was too much. I, f I felt I had too much invested. You know, it's not just my life, but everything was at risk. And if this thought um, was obliterated, I wasn't sure what what was there. You know. We'll come on to that in a minute because I really have a, an interesting question about that. Well, I feel it's interesting anyway. Um, but you also say in the book you arrived at zero point. Mm. You saw it at zero point. Mm. And you were about to be surrendered. Mm. As you, were, you were about to mm. be surrendered mm. and reabsorb, uh, reabsorbed into mm. the source, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which, which I can completely understand. Yeah. Reabsorbed mm. into the source. Um, one more step and there mm. would be no return. Mm. And as you said, I was staring into the merciless face of God. Mm. And then you said, it is not my time, mm. please let me go. Mm. Yeah. And I know afterwards you, um, you had a regret about it, mm. but I, I, do you still have that regret? No, because, um, because the following day it happened naturally. You know, because um, at that time I wasn't ready, which was mm. only about 12 hours or 24 hours before it happened. And after this, I, ha I felt I had to go through this fear process. Mm. You know, it was almost like a, an, an essential step, you know, because after that I sort of finally got myself back together again. I then went to sleep and during the night a lot of stuff was worked out internally, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and then the next day, <coughs> um, things started on a very gentle note. My day started very beautifully. Mm. It was almost as if something had happened that prepared the way for me to, to enter through the gate, if you like, you know, in, in a very natural, beautiful way and harmonious way. And um, that, was, that was where the big change took place because it was a really nice morning and the sun was shining and it was reflecting on the leaves on the grass and I thought, oh, how beautiful everything is, you know. And then the light, um, which was reflected from the grass and the leaves, took on a, a new intensity and I was <coughs> en enchanted by the beauty of it and the intensity until I realized <coughs> that it was not the sun reflecting on the grass, it was just pure energy, you know, everything mm. was pure energy. 
And as I looked around me, I found that everything, everything was pure energy, you know. And, and so this energy sort of came towards me, and then I looked down on my, on my legs, and I found, oh, I'm, I'm pure energy, you know, everything turned into light. And then I had this rather flippant thought, I wonder whether I'm enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which was so quite inappropriate. Uh, I sort of, I laughed to myself uh, because it was such a curious way of sort of documenting enlightenment. But what happened was, um, uh, at that moment, this incredible thing happened, which even now I, I find no words to describe it, which was very much in the vein of my very first experience when I was a student. <coughs> but of course, each one of these experiences are different. They are always new. And I found during this experience, I sort of stepped into this awareness that um, I, I, that was a real truth of it, the um, everything else, I, I don't even know how to describe it. It was more like a memory, a, a recall. It was a recall of who I really am, you know, mm. in my essence. And I've always been that, except all my life I've been distracted from it, you know. And the beautiful thing was, of course, I realized that applied to everything in life. Every human being, every animal, every blade of grass. It had a true state uh, which was just not recognized because we are simply preoccupied with so many other uh, distractions. And, and then <coughs> it was almost like stepping over. And I thought, oh, I don't have to I don't have to worry about any of the other things anymore. And and I found I found my true identity then. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that is a natural me. This it's nothing special. It's just the way it's meant to be. Okay? And then everything <coughs> everything from then on shifted into this new type of awareness. I couldn't see it any longer from my personal reference point, you know, everything I <coughs> I looked at was seen <coughs> was seen from this viewpoint, you know, and um, and measured or reflected back on it, and that viewpoint was that I no longer had an outside world, you know, there was nothing separate from me. The so-called inside and outside were collapsed into yes, one. Yes, yes. Yeah. There was just this awareness, and that was a permanence, and, and the shining basis of everything that existed everywhere mm. I looked. You know, there was no difference. And, and so, yeah, everything was, became beautified in a way. Everything may, uh, gave, had a new sense. You know, it was almost like, like living every moment new. Everything had a purpose, had a, had a place, um, and this hasn't stopped. <coughs> Since then, I haven't been able to, to see things any other way anymore. You know, they are just the way they are, and <coughs> and of course, it's not something that is the same. It, it evolves, you know, and every day brings new aspects to the surface, which I hadn't known before. Mm. So all I did at that day, I simply opened a door, you know, and that was uh, the big change then that took place. Thank you. We need, I'm looking at the clock, we need to finish now. Okay. But, um, it was 40 years of meditation yeah, it and does some take very hard it work. And I, just to say one thing briefly before we finish, that 
it's interesting. We've had other people on Conscious TV that have got to this point that you've got to, and some have somehow allowed themselves to completely be reabsorbed, mm. yet it's taken them years mm. to rebuild some kind of personality. Mm -hmm. And it seems that you made absolutely the right decision mm. because you said no when it was too much, mm. Mm. and then something more gentle happened mm -hmm. after that. And yeah. I think that's probably a message for people. You mm. don't always have to force these things. You no. don't always have to be faced with complete annihilation because we have to live as human beings as yes, well. Yes, yes. So it's a very beautiful way of meditating, you know, which is very rewarding. And I, I put it in the end of my book. Yes. Thank you very much, Jürgen, for yes, coming along you, to yes, Conscious yes, TV. Yes. And of course, there's another parallel interview that Renata, my wife, is going to do with Jürgen after this, um, which is a whole other aspect of his life, which is very significant, which I couldn't cover everything in this interview. So if, you, if, you, if, you, if you've enjoyed this interview, then do find the other one. If you're watching this on television somewhere, then you may have to revert to the internet to find the other one, but you will find it. So I'm going to show the 10 minute moment book again, which has very much been the basis of the latter part of the interview. And the other ones briefly he wrote are The Multi-Dimensional Man, and vistas of infinity. So thank you for watching Conscious TV and as always I hope we see you again I hope we see you again soon. Goodbye.